Welcome back to Cocktails and Classics. This week we watched Do the Right Thing. And in today's episode we have myself, Cameron, Zach, Carlos, and Ben. And to kick things off this week and get everybody in the right mood, I'm going to pass it over to Carlos to give us our drink for this week's movie. Thank you for tuning in again, everyone. It's great to be back. And for this week's episode, we are enjoying a Miller High Life. As enjoyed in the movie we watched this week, Do the Right Thing. Um, it's been a little while since I've had a Miller High Life, but man, it it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. And, Ew. Uh, Ew. Gross. I know you're shaking Miller your head, sucks. but uh, it, it, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It was a good time. Gross. I'm not a, I'm not a big domestic guy. Like I'm not a, a big beer really... guy in general, so this well, was a hard yeah. pass for me. Dylan's bougie. Well, they say it's the champagne of beers. It is the champagne of beers. However, what if you don't like champagne either? Well, <laughs> I will say Miller High Life, I put it like on the tier below like Miller Light, Bud Light. Like, oh, if really? I'm going to be. Well, yeah, I don't I don't really like I don't like High Life that much. I don't know why. It just, eh, I, I'd, well, I'd take other see, beers over for it. me, it ranks somewhere below Natter Days and above <laughs> Hams. <laughs> is, I think everything's below Natter Days yeah. for Cam, though. <laughs> what, above Hams? No, it's it's definitely above that Miller Lite and Bud Light. So go ahead and sit back and sip on that Miller High Life you got there. And we're going to be talking about Do the Right thing there will be spoilers from here on out so heads up so stick around for our post movie discussion do the right thing is a 1989 film it's currently at a 7.9 out of 10 on imdb from the world's biggest knicks fan spike lee brief little plot <laughs> summary on the hottest day of the year on a street in the bed section of brooklyn everyone's hate and bigotry smolders and builds until it explodes into violence uh, written and directed by spike lee composed by Spike Lee's father, a jazz musician. Um, this movie stars uh, Danny Aiello as Sal, uh, Ruby D as mother sister, Giancarlos Esposito as Buggin' Out, Spike Lee as Mookie, uh, John Totoro as Pino. Uh, you have um, Martin Lawrence is in there. Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Like, Jackson. This movie yep. is stacked. Yeah. Samuel L. Like, this movie is stacked. Um, it was nominated for two Oscars, Best Acting in a Supporting Role for Danny Aiello, and Best Writing, Screenplay Written Directly for the Screen, Spike Lee. Cameron, what was your reaction to Do the Right Thing? If you had told me this movie was made like last month, I would have believed you as well, just because I feel like nothing's fucking changed. It's the same shit. Like, honestly, it's just like, yeah. And the movie was like good because I feel like a lot of it was very... Like, it was kind of lighthearted for a lot of the movie, but then the last, like, 20 mo minutes of the movie just hits you like a ton of bricks. Like, it goes from, like, a little bit lighthearted to some racial tension, for sure, to, like, obviously downright racism in some parts. Um, but then, like, the last 20 minutes is just, like, 30 to, like, 100 immediately, uh, which I thought was, like, crazy. Like, it was crazy. It was good. It was very good. Definitely. It's almost like a character study. For the first part, it's literally just like follows these different people within this neighborhood, different ethnicities, different points in their life, and you see what their day is, because it, it, it's like a slice of life almost, a day in a life in this neighborhood. It happens to be the, the hottest day until tomorrow, uh, supposedly, and as the temperature rises and swells, so does the tension, uh, well, racial tension pretty much in the neighborhood of bed here and uh yeah I, I was thinking the same thing i'm like leading up to the last 30 minutes you kind of don't really get what's gonna come you don't get this explosion until like they go into the pizza place and turn on radio rahim's radio in in kind of like this encompassing snapshot of this community it's little bits of maybe 
it's like tension or or even conflict but up to that point it's i don't know like spike lee kind of either takes it and you know some things that are a little more lighthearted. um like the one thing i you know that i can think of is uh radio raheem when he's uh kind of staring down i think it's um one of the uh the, the the Puerto Rican residents, um, and they they could kind of both have their their boom boxes going, and um, you know it's kind of just like that that stare down between like the music kind of thing. Like it's obviously a tense situation, um, but you know it, it's diffused pretty you know pretty pretty quickly. Um, but then it's not kind of on to you know whatever else comes next. Ultimately leading up to this big explosion of um, you know this of, of all this tension that is released through. Um, they're obviously the events that take place at the end of the movie. Yeah, Radio Rahim won. His boombox was louder. It was funny because, like, they have that stare down or a, like, boombox battle, basically. Mm-hmm. And then the other guy's like, all right, you win. And then all the other, like, Puerto Rican guys are like, he's a bitch. <laughs> he's like, like, as he's walking away, they're like, I was like, wait, I thought he won. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the same thing when I saw that. I was like, wait, he just won. And, and the, the other guy backed off. Why aren't you trying to start shit with him now? Just let him walk away. Uh, yeah, I think this movie does a great job of looking at kind of taking bed and trying to show you Spike Lee's perspective of, of the neighborhood. But I also think it hits on something Spike Lee does really well in, I think, a lot of the movies he writes, which is just tell stories based on people. It's not usually something about someone who does something super grand. It's just your regular average day-to-day person. But that's what, you know, and that's what's so, I guess, relevant to the audience. Because, I mean, the day-to-day life of a lot of people in the U.S. or in different neighborhoods, like, you know, it's, it might be these, you know, or like ordinary people, like you said, but under kind of like, extraordinary circumstances with the amount of underlying racial tension that you don't see on the surface. And this movie is, is a modern day, like Greek tragedy. Um, you have the like Greek chorus of ML sweet Dick Willie and coconut Sid, who are always like chirping back and forth. Uh, and we cut to them. It all takes place in one setting. Typically. Um, it all takes place in that neighborhood. Um, you have, uh, almost like your narrator in a sense of like Samuel L. Jackson, who is like all seeing and like watching over everything. And I think it definitely translates this old, like this old medium of like theater into a modern day film very well. Yeah. This feels like a play. Um, I don't know if it's been made into a play, but I'm sure it would do really well as one if it hasn't been. Definitely, and it, I maybe it's just the like setting that it's in because at the beginning, when it's playing "Fight the Power," uh, the g- fucking greatest song ever. You just hear "Fight the Power" and you just get so hype. Oh my god, great song. Um, One quick note about the intro is I felt like that was a Spike Lee version of the James Bond intro. I could see that, <laughs> <laughs> but thirty times longer. Pretty very, sure he very played long, the entire but song. Five minutes long. And way more badass, but it was funny because, uh, yeah, I just I saw that and I was like, this reminds me of the Bond intro, but way more powerful, I guess. But yeah. So I don't know if you guys knew, but uh, this the song "Fight the Power" was actually written for this movie. That's something I didn't really? know going in. I didn't know yeah. that. Spike Lee Jeez. asked Public Enemy to write a song, and this is what they came up with. Yeah, because if you notice in this version, I don't think there's like the horns in the oh, album version. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Because I was like listening to this, and I'm like. This is like slightly different. And I don't know if they're just doing like the score over the song, but it does make sense that like this is like the movie version, and then I think maybe the album version is slightly different. Mm-hmm. But that like intro where we see the 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 lady dancing uh, definitely looks like a stage like play. Yeah, you part. get play vibes right from the beginning. Yeah. Was there a memorable scene for anyone? I mean, there were a ton, I guess, uh, to keep it short and sweet. Anytime you got to see Mookie walking around the neighborhood and just chit-chatting with people as he's walking up and down, and, uh, walking up and down the street, that was great. Just to see, like, the... It's a plain, just everyday casual interaction, 
but that sort of stuff is hard to do. And I think Spike Lee pulled it off really well. Um, for me, I think the final scene where Radio Rahim is murdered by the police and Mookie, like Mookie almost kind of breaks and throws the trash can through the window. It, it is like so powerful to watch and it is so like gut wrenching at the same time. You, you, you kind of, you don't necessarily know that it's going to like get to this point because Sal, Sal kind of comes off as like a genuine like guy. Cause he's always like keeping Pino in check. He's like, you know, like I've, I've been in this neighborhood for 25 years or whatever. And I've watched these people grow old. I've watched these kids grow up and like we owe everything to these people. But then he still holds these like racial like stereotypes and bigotry inside of him. And when Radio Rahim comes in and he's playing his boombox and he and he says things like, oh, like we don't want any of that African music in here. And he, and he pulls out the bat. He, he pulls out the bat multiple times. So you, I, I guess they kind of hint that it's like it's going to get to this point. And and you're, you kind of feel bad for Sal in a sense of like he he's not necessarily this bad guy. But in the end, you're like he's just as bad as Pino. I mean, it's not like Pino just picked it up from working in the black neighborhood. He obviously right. picked it up from somewhere. Right. Yeah, it does a really good job showing just how deeply rooted that racism is. Exactly. You get scenes yeah. with Sal talking to Mookie's sister and, you know, the the one-on-one he has there with Pino. And then still at the end, he's on the other end of the counter with a baseball bat. Right. Which is, I mean, like I said, it, it tends to like, kind of like what I was saying earlier. It's like, yeah, he, he at the beginning of the film, Sal might be this like ordinary guy to the audience who just, you know, owns a pizza shop. At least that's how, you know, he's portrayed maybe like from the get-go. But then you see that all this underlying stuff that, you know, is encompassing, you know, his character is obviously brought to light, like, so easily. And then it's like, and then I'm sure the audience is then like, wow, like, okay, like, yeah, there's clearly all that that has been under the surface this whole time. Um, and, and like Dylan said, like, it is, it is, it's tragic to see um, Mookie, you know, at his, you know, finally reaches breaking point because you know up to that point he's he's been involved with all those different scenarios and he's kind of like i guess he's i see mookie as more like representative of the community also collapsing like where mookie has his breaking point the community does as well and at the end it almost feels like it's kind of water under the bridge in a sense when mookie goes back to ask for his pay and and he's like, like Sal, pay me, Sal, pay me, and, and and Sal is still like angry. He's still holding that in when he like throws the hundred dollar bills at him. Oh yes, yeah, Sal like, lost his money. store. Well, he, yes, his yes, building, get the insurance money, and all that. But <laughs> well, but he's like, I don't care about the money. I built this store. Every fixture, yeah. every tile, I put it together, and it's all gone now. Yeah, I mean, you got to think. He said he's been in that neighborhood for what twenty something years. Yeah. So I mean, it's not that. You know, it's. Yeah, the fact that he literally built this business in this place with so 25 years worth of memories where his kids grew up in it and now it's just in in one night gone. Yeah. What but, a lot of good that did them, you know? Well, one out of two ain't bad. Vito is cool. Pino sucked though. <laughs> <laughs> but like Dylan was saying though, yeah, it does almost feel like they just kind of move on the next day. Like yeah, because he he throws the money at him and he, and he's pissed, but then he's just kind of like, "So what are you gonna what are you gonna do?" And he's like, "I gotta go see my kid." Well, he also gives him more. He also gives him more money than he's owed too. Well, he he does kind of say like when he's talking, they're like, "Oh, we've had a good day." He's like, "I'm gonna rename it Sal and Sons." And Mookie, you always got a place yeah. here. You're basically family. It just got too happy. And it's like I feel like Mookie and Jade have that special place in Sal's heart as well. So maybe maybe it's not water under the bridge, but it's like Sal can't blame Mookie. Well, it's for... not. Well, I think I don't like I said. It's I don't think it's water under the bridge either. I I more or less like I think it's like I think Sal kind of takes that as like okay, now I hear you, kind of thing. It's like yeah, you you did what you had to do. It's like now it's like now I hear you know what what you've been trying to tell me and like what what probably like what Sal's character has probably needed since the get go. I think Sal at one point, he is the one that tells Mookie, you do what you got to do. I think, right. 
I I think yeah, I think, I think so. he does say that to him. I think when I think when Mookie Mookie's like pay me like can you pay me early something like that blah blah. blah. I think Sal says to him, "You do what you got to do," and it, I think that's kind of like foreshadowing. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of foreshadowing in this movie. At the beginning, Sal literally says, "I'm gonna kill someone today," which maybe he didn't literally kill someone, but he kind of did. But I mean, he he escalated it to the point where right. Where the police got yeah. called. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I will say it doesn't seem like it's like water under the bridge. It seems though they they reach this giant crashing point in, in the final parts of the movie. And then, you know, everyone kind of wakes up the next day and it seems like they just kind of start rebuilding. They, they just kind of get back it. And I think that's kind of the interesting thing with it being that it just kind of seems like it's a day in the life in bed sty is that the next day it's a new day. It, it's, you know, seems like it's, it's a, it's a new day. The story, you could do a movie that starts the beginning of the next day and just do another course of a whole day. You know, and wa- watching it, it was kind of just my hope that like, you know, since they're, since I guess then technically the next step yet yeah, is to, rebuild and i guess re- restart the next day but it would be you know to also to to grieve but then to also for for sal to realize like okay like you know i i if i'm going to be someone who is you know servicing this community um i have to be i have to take it upon myself to um immerse myself into the community by representing them um through my business because I know that was a big thing for for bugging out was the fact that Sal has a bunch of um, white celebrities on the wall and none are representative of the actual community that he's in. See, I didn't get the feeling after watching the movie that it ended on anything near a happy note. It was just same old shit. They they talk about you know so heat in in movies is typically used for like some sort of escalation. They talk about the next day it's even hotter. So like, I feel like Spike Lee leaves us on a note of, yet yeah, nothing is actually better. Nobody really learned a lesson. There's no, I don't know. It, it's the thing that Spike Lee does really well here is he doesn't fix the problem. He just makes a movie about the problem and, and yeah. just gives it to you. Like, hey, this is here and it's not fixed and you can have it because we're having it. Right. Because because honestly, like after after watching Sal at the end of it, like sure, him and Mookie have you know that that last exchange, but it's like, does it really change his racial biases? I mean, did it really address that? No. And so he could, you know, he could start building up his store the next day with, you know, having that much prejudice and that much, um, you know, having that much hate uh, just as much. Right. And I'm sure Pino feels vindicated. He was, he, in his mind, he's right. Like, even though he's, I don't think he's correct. Like, you know, he didn't want to be in that neighborhood because he thought it was too dangerous and he's racist and doesn't like black people. And in his mind, he's probably like, yeah, I was right. We Our business got destroyed by these people. Which I'm glad we didn't we didn't witness that at all. Like, like he, he they do show him, I think, at one point, like right as Mookie is like busting the glass out of the window. And I'm glad we didn't get that like, oh, see, I was like, I was right yeah, kind of thing. Which is obviously from, such bullshit. From Pino, but... but I, I think you do kind of like you see him and he, he kind of it's not necessarily smug, but it is kind of like a, I told you so look. And it's like, well, right. And, and and that's the thing about like, you know, because that's him, him, you know, saying that at the end or like that, that quick shot of, of Pino at the end is like, as again, it's representative of, you know, that that demographic of people, you know, after we have like, um, you know, these events that unfold like in the U.S., like that that feel vindicated like that be like oh like see like see see where it's like no you you don't get it like you really don't understand like what has actually happened here because not at one point you know for sal or pino or like any of those other characters do they really like it doesn't for them it doesn't sink in about the fact that like okay uh radio rahim has just been killed but their concern is still just on the business you know it's still just on the the property and like money aspect not the fact that like oh hey i just escalated this situation to a point where like a kid just lost his life like that doesn't that it doesn't sink that's that's what i think it blew my freaking mind like that it just didn't sink in and like you know and 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 obviously then 
no knowing that that's not resolved in the minds of you know sal and 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 his sons it's like okay well that that's kind of the point where mookie's like well <laughs> he clearly doesn't get it like and, and like i've seen I literally just seen all this unfold what the heck yeah i i'd seen this movie before and you know now watching it in context of 2020 and what happened in minnesota like this movie was made in 1989 and it's literally <laughs> the same shit again and like i had to i had to google there's a man they say they like chant his name after radio rahim dies there's like the mob outside of the store and they're chanting a man's name it's, uh, michael stewart michael stewart sorry yeah yeah i think the police like beat him and his friends and I, and i had to look that up but it's like it's the same shit dude like he, uh, by the way, this was his capital uh, pun- offense, is he wrote graffiti in soft tip marker on the New York City subway. That was his capital offense. That's how he died, is he wrote graffiti on the subway and then was murdered by the police. Yeah. It, I mean, it's like it's like Cam said. Like, if you were to remake this and change the names, it's, it's the same shit. Something has to change. Yeah. And... I was just so fucking sad at the end of the movie because I was like, this is the f- same fucking shit that they, like, today, that they were making movies about 31 years 20, ago. You know, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. And they're probably going to keep making the same shit for another 30 years. Yeah. And I, I, I'd I, like to know if the title is kind of ironic in a sense of, like, it's do the right thing no one in the movie necessarily does the right thing i guess you could say mookie does the right thing one guy does finally once he like i don't know when i guess in this in the sense of like bugging out like he tells him to stay black so once he once he finally like goes back and and throws the dumpster through the the window he kind of like leaves Sal's side because he's almost like the intermediate between like the Italian Americans and the and the black community there, right? And, and he he like leaves that side of the Italian Americans and and he goes back to like Radio Rahim's side, I guess you would say, it, and maybe like that's doing the right thing, but I I think no one no, in I the think... movie is necessarily doing the right thing. Like every like the cops no. fuck up the. Sal fucks up. I think one person in the movie does the right thing. And it's Demare. Maybe I I understand what you're saying, but yeah, Demare does the right thing, a couple of times. He buys the flowers. He treats what's her face nice. Uh, mother, 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 mother sister. sister. Mother, sister. He saves the kid, and he isn't even mad when he like blatantly lies to his mom. He's like, "This old man pushed me down." <laughs> like, what the? What are you talking about? It's like how what. I think the title of the movie exists to beg the question. That's the, I think Spike Lee named the movie the way he did so that people would consistently ask, like, who did the right thing? Did Mookie do the right thing? Did anybody do the right thing? But I think the movie itself is really just sort of a... Um, it's like a, a live acting version of the monologue that uh, Radio Rahim gives where he's... It's, and it's a throwback to an older movie, but he's given the love and hate speech and the the symbolism between uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. I think that's really what the movie is, is this constant struggle to like love everybody and be kind to one another. But at the same time, when there's that constant injustice and that kind of rage that just builds in you your whole life. At the end of the movie, you get a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. And you get a a Martin uh, Malcolm X quote to see that, that almost duality of man in a sense but also yeah. that, like, I mean, obviously, the civil rights movement would wouldn't happen without violence and nonviolence. That's why we have these riots. That's why we see this right. stuff happen. Is because at a certain point, no one listens, so it has to escalate to something to get attention. And historically, I mean, that's that's you know that that has been the question. It's like either you know, it's like, do you do what is right by societal norms or do you do what you have to in order to overcome injustice? You know, and that exists for, you know, all, all minorities in the U.S. and uh, for, you know, I'm thinking of another one, you know, like unions too. Um, 
I mean, there was a lot of that going, you know, going on too in the in the early early twentieth century. And it's just, yeah, it, it's it's you know, do you do what is right by society, or do you do what you have to to be heard and to to overcome it? And I think it's beautiful that the movie ends on like one of the last lines is "Love, Daddy," saying register to vote the election's coming up yep be heard do we do we have any lines does does anyone have a, a quote or a line from the movie i think the the one and this goes kind of back to where i said no and i don't mean like it ends on like a happy note um but it's where uh mother sister and the mayor are talking and I think they say something along the lines of um, they said, hope the mayor says, hope the block is still standing. And mother sister replies with, we're still standing after the, the night of the riot. So I, I think that's kind of what I meant by like, it, it seems like they're after what happens, they, they try to get back into like building re- better relations. Uh, one that hit me, not so much one single quote, but the conversation between Pino and Mookie, where he's asking them, like, who's your favorite basketball player? Magic Johnson. Who's your favorite movie star? Eddie Murphy. He's like, <laughs> the Prince line's kind of funny. No, I like Bruce. I like the boss. <laughs> but uh, he was like, when when Pino tries to say, you know, they're black, but they're not like, you know, black. It, it, it's a really good insight into like what the hell are you thinking people like you, say that you kind like of them today. so it's different right. oh yeah yeah no it's yeah. it's not unfortunately it's not outdated um, right what happens is that type of thing instead of saying they're not like black they say they're uh well spoken or well educated. educated yeah right it's like all these essentially all these things to say like they don't fit the stereotype of black people. That exactly. I yeah. Like they're using right. like that to like yeah. almost like dissociate like that specific circumstance, you know, that, that case, like from, from all these, yeah, the stereotypes that, that have existed to encompass the entire race. Like <laughs> yeah, it shows you that these people have a stereotype in their mind right. of a race of people that they hate. And they're willing to, instead of forgoing that, like that, that truth that they want to hold on to, they're willing to make all these exceptions for every black person they actually admire or meet rather than undo the stereotype they believe in. It's yeah. It's shocking to me how that's a real thing. Or they or making exceptions for yeah, just the ones that I guess that, that fit their their societal schema of norms. Yeah. And then Pino is like, Oh, I read. I read Pastor Farrakhan's book and and here's how I can discredit you because I read this person's book and and I know like mm-hmm. yo you guys used to rule the world or whatever and it's like oh, yeah yep 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 I, I I know Dylan like, I think I was thinking the same just thing. that argument like, just I know. annoys the shit out of me and it is still used today oh my god Mookie's yeah. like yeah civilization started in Africa and Pino laughs at him like no that's a fact that's <laughs> a literal <laughs> fact. It started in Ethiopia. That's a wait, wait, wait. fact. Did you did you read the Bible? Because <laughs> how about uh, Sweet Dick Willie? You wanna you wanna you wanna boycott someone? You gotta start with the goddamn barber that fucked up your head. Oh my god, I love fantastic. that one. That one, uh, it's fantastic. I love when those sick burn. I love when those guys are just kind of shooting the oh, shit yeah. and they're just going back and forth on each other. Those, yeah. those scenes are great. Oh yeah, he's like, you're gonna you're gonna build a boat, <laughs> motherfucker. You ain't got a quarter. How are you gonna buy a boat? <laughs> <laughs> if Mike Tyson dreams about about punching me, he better wake up and apologize. You you think you're gonna you think you could beat Mike Tyson? I know I could beat Mike Tyson. Oh, Mike Tyson. <laughs> I remember when he was over here and he him. took that ice cream cone from that little kid. <laughs> Always oh, the, been a bully. <laughs> the Tina line, trust you. Last time I trusted you, Mookie, I ended up with a son. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Uh I didn't know he had a son until that line. <laughs> it's oh, yeah, like, Hector's oh shit, this dude has a kid. Because <laughs> yeah. it doesn't talk he doesn't talk yeah. about it for like most of the movie, but then well, you in see the second Tina, half. Yeah. You see Tina with the kid, but it's never really expressed that it's Mookie's. Um another one, uh you asking a lot to make a ch- to make a man change his beer from Demer. And they don't have any uh, <laughs> Miller High Life at the uh, store. So I'm not drinking Miller Light. <laughs> it's Radio Raheem, uh, Sonny, and Kim. And he's like, they're talking about the batteries. And if 
finally the guy's like how many you say and he goes 20 motherfucker 20 <laughs> the guy goes motherfuck you and he goes motherfuck you <laughs> you all right man <laughs> <laughs> like walks out like it it's no big deal like they finally have an understanding oh that was good is that the name of the korean couple sunny and kim mm-hmm. yeah T- guys just real quick to bring this back around to tie us back together uh <laughs> steve park who is is he sunny i want to say, say he's sunny he's sunny in so the the male uh korean clerk is in fargo what oh is he the the he's oh, like the yeah, boyfriend the, he's the yeah, creepy yeah. date He's yes, the the guy yeah. who tries to hook back oh, up with oh um, with uh um what's her name yeah the uh the sheriff yeah the right. detective oh yeah. Yeah. oh yeah yeah oh yeah okay yeah blow my mind how crazy how crazy is that guys we just came full bring circle. it back full circle real Martin quick. Lawrence's crew fucking instigators <laughs> oh my god <laughs> like yeah. if anyone's oh. not doing the right thing. It's them. They're just hype. <laughs> like when uh, when Bugging Out gets his sneaker stuffed on, and they're like, he, they are chaotic neutral. Yeah. When it, when they're like, <laughs> he's like going off on the dude with the Larry Bird jersey, and they're like in the back there, like kick his ass, kick his ass, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, why don't you go back to Massachusetts? I was born in Brooklyn. Ah! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Clifton is yeah, his Clifton, name, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Clifton. And then the like, even in the pizzeria, they're like. They're like stoking them and shit. They're like, Sal, Sal, you're going to let him do that? And you're just like, oh, stop, stop. After Sal let them in, you know, it's closing time. And Sal's like, come on in. I know I know these kids. They're fine. Wasn't it also them with the fire hydrant and the, the, guy, the guy who drives fast with the convertible? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Perfect case of like, maybe just be a little nice and they would have held the water right, for you. Or but... go pick it just, <laughs> or just drive down a different street. <laughs> yeah, just turn around and go the other way. Yeah. But that scene leads up to another quote that I loved in this movie was the mayor when he the police are trying to figure stuff out. And he's like, those that'll tell don't know. And those that know won't tell. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business and self-development. But essentially what it is, is every month you get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from their monthly selection. So, Dylan and Zach, what are your experiences with Audible? So, working from home nowadays, I recently used Audible to rip through one of my favorite book series. It's always great to go back and revisit some of your favorites. And since we've recently done From Russia With Love, you could, could check out some of Ian Fleming's books on Audible. Uh... They have Dan Stevens, Toby Stevens, uh, Damian Lewis, many great narrators read through Diamonds Are Forever from Russia with Love, Live and Let Die. So maybe you want to get into the James Bond novels as well as the movies. To start your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com slash cocktails and classics, all lowercase. Again, that's audible.com slash cocktails, A-N-D, classics. After your free trial is up, it costs fourteen ninety five per month. However, there are no commitments, and if you can't decide what to listen to, that's okay. You can roll your credits over up to one year. So this week's podcast is brought to you by Surfside Sips. They make high impact glass straws. They're a family owned company, and and what's better than saving saving the turts? You know, the turts, <laughs> the turts. <laughs> You know, I'm one of those people who hates using paper straws. Paper straws fucking suck. Paper straws suck. suck. I love the worst what solution. they do. I love the, that we're, we're minimizing the use of plastic straws. I enjoy that. Paper straws suck ass. They suck. They're the worst possible solution because turns out, guess what? Paper and water don't fucking mix, okay? I don't know who came <laughs> up with it, but it doesn't work. Even though, even though they put coating on it to try and help, it doesn't work. It just gets soggy, and you end up throwing it away anyway, and that's just more waste. And so, But you know what doesn't get soggy? Glass. Yeah. Glass straws from Surfside Sips. And if you want to get some glass straws from Surfside Sips, you can use coupon code Cocktails and Classics spelled out. That's Cocktails, A-N-D, Classics, for 20% off your order. And if you're looking for a business to support during this time, seems like a good idea. 
little bit of a tradition around here as Zach takes over and gives us a trivia quiz. So, Zach, take it away. Thanks, Dylan. I hope you guys are ready. So, uh, the first question. According to the newspaper at the beginning of the film, what is the date of the first day, the day where the bulk of the movie takes place? Is it A, August 5th, B, August 8th, or C, August 9th? I'm going to say C, August 9th. I'm also going to say August 9th. I'm going to say the 5th. I feel like I would have noticed August 9th, so I'm going to say A. I'm going to go with August 8th. 8, 8. Well, I thought this was a really interesting fun fact. We have a couple of birthdays in the friend group. Uh, in this little slur of dates, uh, Cameron's birthday, I believe, is the 9th. Yeah. But the answer was A, August 5th, which is my Woo! wife's birthday. Nice. Does that uh, does that day align with anything? I, f- I feel like it would have had like a significance. but Her birthday. Remember, remember, the 5th of August. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just thinking like maybe, maybe like something like the events of this movie. No, it was, uh, it was the six-year precursor to my wife's first birthday. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> Spike Lee's really fortune-telling. His favorite team is the Knicks. His second favorite team is Zach's wife. <laughs> oh. Team Zach's team wife. Zach's wife. <laughs> you guys know I like counting things. Question, question number two. How many times is the word fuck used in the movie? Oh, I think I actually know this one. Oh. Is it A, 40 times, B, 140 times, or C, 240 times. 240 times a lot. Is it, is it uncut gems level <laughs> of fucks? <laughs> <Jeez>. or... <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll say 140 on this one. Yeah, I agree. 240 seems high. That's like... 140 is already like more than one fuck per minute. And 240 <laughs> would be like almost two per minute, which is insane. Is, Actually, that... sorry. 240 is exactly two fucks per minute, which is a lot. So I'll say 40. 140. Ben, what is your answer? 140. Fuck, Dylan. God. All right. Jesus. It's actually C. It's like 240. It is two fucks per minute. Wow. Oh, my God. It is 240. That's crazy. I saw that stat uh, last night when I was doing the doing the outline. Cheater. Cheater. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it was an accident. I don't, I don't look at the trivia, but it came up. Fuck you, Dylan. Hey, Sherlock Holmes. Hey, Sherlock Holmes. Quit looking for clues for the fucking quiz. Fuck you, Dylan. What Dylan's happened gonna was I was, looking still lose. At, <laughs> I was looking at the, the parental ratings, and I was like, huh, I wonder what the parental rating for nudity is, because there's literally a shot of tits. And it was like, Nip-nacks. it's moderate. <laughs> and I was like, huh. And just below that was the profanity thing, and it says, like, there's 253 fucks in the movie or something. Yeah. Well, question number three. Which of the following Italian-Americans pictured on the wall in the movie was not considered for the role of Sal? A, Joe Pesci, B, Al Pacino, or C, Robert De Niro? Is it a trick question? Was Joe Pesci on the wall? That was my question. Is I did not see Joe yeah. Pesci on the wall. I bet yeah. he is, but he was the only one that we didn't get a close-up of, of those three. Uh, I'll, say, I'll say Al Pacino. I'm also going to say Al Pacino just because I can't see it, but my gut kind of says it's Joe Pesci, but I will go with Al Pacino. I'm going to... Man, I'm that's I'm torn. I think I'm gonna say De Niro. I'm I'm gonna say I don't think De Niro was approached. Maybe he was like too too big. Maybe I'm gonna say Joe Pesci just because that's what I want it to be. Yeah, try to picture any of these three gentlemen playing Sal. Like Al Pacino, super angry. Joe Pesci, even angrier. Robert De Niro was approached to be Sal in the movie, but for that exact reason, he was too big. Uh, it was turned down. They were afraid that it would that Robert De Niro would take over the movie. Um, so the answer is actually Al Pacino was never offered the role of Sal. So is that Carlos one? It is a Cameron win. Woo! Cameron, okay, Cameron got the first one right. I forgot. I couldn't. I couldn't see him as Sal. He's like I could see the either Joe Pesci or De Niro being him, but Al Pacino doesn't. Wouldn't really make sense to me. Those of us who have seen this film, 
wrote down our ratings based off memory and nostalgia, and now I want to know if your rating has changed or not. Uh, going in, I, I had seen this movie before, uh, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, going in, I gave it a 7 out of 10. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I watched it in college, so like maybe 2012, 2013. Um, and watching it now in 2020 with the world context around us that has happened god damn is this movie so poignant like like cameron said you could you could cut this movie and make it today and change the names and it it's the same shit that's happening today that happened 31 years ago it's beautifully shot there's so much like off kilter cinematography and and the dialogue and the way it's written just it makes you feel uncomfortable in in the best way possible like these things are supposed to make you feel uncomfortable like racism and these racist words and phrases should make you feel uncomfortable they should make you think about the world around you and that's what this movie does it makes you feel just gets you pissed off the public enemy song in the background and the and the score it just swells and and it makes you want to change the world around you and for that reason i think spike lee fucking knocked it out of the park with this movie and honestly i'm gonna give it uh eight and a half out of ten i think this is a fantastic film uh a very important african-american movie a very important american movie and i think this movie will live on until the end of time much like dylan i saw this movie in college uh around i think mine i saw it in maybe like 2013 uh and this was one of those movies that i actually that you watch for a class that i i actually really enjoyed so going into it i had given it this movie in an eight out of ten i really enjoyed it i loved the cast i loved the the themes of the movie and and how it kind of really makes you think and and it kind of opens your eyes um and I think it's this is going to be super repetitive, but viewed through today's lens, this movie becomes so much more important. Uh, I think this is a movie like 12 Angry Men and other movies we've seen that are a bit more political. It's a movie most everyone should see. I think this movie should damn near be required. I was just going to say, I feel like it's a crime that I, I didn't see this movie until I was in college. I feel like this yeah. is one of those ones they show you in high school, and it's like, like, sure, you're not as quite mature, but here's this movie. There's a lot of fucks. There's like some nudity, but like, you should just be slapped in the face with this, this issue. Yeah, that's the thing. Is is it does feel like it should be, even if it's not like high school, but this should be on every like, if there's a college that has like an intro to, basically like a university studies or whatever this should be a part of of that like i said it it feels so insane to me that it's more poignant now than it was six years ago when i watched it and it's just as poignant now as it was 30 years ago when it was released um and because of the fact that it's held up and it still makes you think and it makes you feel i bumped this up to an eight and a half i i thought it was a great movie i i love this movie i think People should definitely check it out. Watch it if you haven't seen it. If you have seen it and it's been a while, rewatch it. Give it a rewatch. Let yourself kind of remember the things you might have missed or let yourself feel more about it now because of the world we live in. I went into it with uh, with an eight, like to an eight and a half-ish. Um, I had seen it like, you know, right around the time, like before I had gone into college. But um, I think what what really changed it for me was the fact that maybe at that point, um, I mean, between, between my own experiences and my own, uh, knowledge of the context of, you know, now watching it in 2020, it, you know, this, this movie is, it's, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't only recommend it. This movie, this movie is, is needed. Um, you know, not only for like right now, but for years down the road for, for, for people of any age to look at, a movie like this and to say oh well you know, i i don't see how this is how this is connected to 
what's happening. It's like, no, this, this is directly what is happening, you know, whether it's on the surface, like we've seen, you know, in recent years, or whether it's underlying and it's just waiting to bubble up until the next big event, you know what I mean? And it, and so you need to look at this from, from the angle of all the characters involved in this movie, because yeah, that, that hate and that bias is existent in a lot of the characters, but it's not brought to the surface because, you know, until like that, that, that monologue, um, and that, and that, and that rant. And so it's, it's super important to look at it from, um, like, uh, a lens of, even though I don't see it, this exists, even though I do not see it, it, it exists and it's, and it's apparent and it bubbles to the surface and it does affect, um, the marginalized communities of the United States. And for appreciating what Spike Lee does in this movie and bringing it to light, um, and, you know, showing, I guess, like the raw emotion behind it, uh, I definitely have a super uh, huge appreciation for that in this film. I give it, I give it 10 out of 10. I actually had not seen this movie. Um, I didn't really know what this movie was about. So I sat down yesterday afternoon, watched it with my wife and I was just kind of awestruck at the end of it. I'm like, how, how is this so, I'll call it disturbingly timeless. It's a movie that's just as relevant today as it was back in 89. It's a movie that's so well done on top of that. I love the structure of the movie where you spend, you know, all but the last 30 minutes just watching these characters interact with each other, getting to know them, all to build up to this really extremely simple but equally sad plot point where Radio Rahim is killed. Um, and you just get to see everybody's reaction and how they deal with it. I think the movie is extremely well done. I won't give it a 10. There are some things, um, some inconsistencies or nitpicking in the acting that I didn't really like, but it is a movie that everybody should see. I think we've all agreed on that. It's It should be a required viewing. You know, we make high school kids read books like you have to read Of Mice and Men or some shit. Why don't you have to watch Do the Right Thing? Somebody go through, edit out the fucks, put in fluffs, put in farts, and remove the uh, ice cube scene. And every high schooler in America should have to watch this. Um, I will give it a 9 out of 10. Like Zach, I didn't really know what this movie was about before going into it. Um, I wanted to watch this movie just because it's one of the best. Like, If you look at lists of movies, like the best movies of all time, a lot of times this one is featured on there. Uh, and so I wanted to give it a go. Uh, I wish everybody said this, but I wish this movie wasn't so prevalent. I really wish that we could look at this and say, wow, that was a crazy time in American history. And it's great that we don't have to worry about that today, which is obviously wrong. And for that, re like at the end, like I was just so sad at the end of the movie, which is a good tell of a movie. Uh, I, I liked how it went through and, you saw everybody's day to day and you saw people just interacting in the first, I liked how the first, you know, hour and 30 minutes felt, it was a little lighthearted. There was, you know, there was obviously some racial tension in there, some tension between actors. Um, but then the last 30 minutes just hits you really bad. Like it, yeah, it, it, go, it goes horribly and things just erupt and, Totally agree with everybody. Not going to repeat it just because, you know, everybody's already said it. But, you know, people should watch it today with an open mind because this is, yeah, um, extremely relevant today. So I thought it was a great movie. Done really well. Holds up. All that stuff. Um, and other, and like I said, it's just really important. This stuff is really important. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10 thought it was really well done great hopefully we look back on this movie as a period piece one day hopefully one day in our lives if you enjoyed this don't forget to register to vote make your voice heard it's the most important thing you can do black lives matter like and subscribe on instagram share us with your friends at cocktails and classics pod send us your drink and movie recommendations and we'll see you next time don't forget to watch responsibly Thank mm -hmm. you.